Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the ELEX virtual pre-conference, Planning for the Evolving Role of Metadata Services. This is a three-part virtual pre-conference being held this week, with the next and final session being held tomorrow, Thursday, at the same time. I'm Liz Wolcott, your host for today's presentation, Session 2, Assessing Metadata Staffing and Workflows, which includes two exciting presentations. Our first presenter today is Arwen Hutt. Arwen Hutt is a metadata librarian at the University of California San Diego Library and the head of the Digital Object Metadata Management Unit. She coordinates and has oversight of the work of the unit, including metadata consulting services and ingest of content for the library's research data curation and the digital library development programs, as well as developing policies, procedures, and standards for metadata management. She is also actively involved in the creation of the UC San Diego Library's Digital Asset Management System, a Hydra-based system utilizing a local data model implemented in RDF. Following Arwen's presentation, we will hear from Nathan Putnam and Bria Parker. Nathan Putnam is the Head of Metadata Services at the University of Maryland, or UMD, in College Park, Maryland, where he manages many of the cataloging and metadata operations for the university libraries. In addition to this, he has taught several library science classes for the Department of Library and Information Science at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., and the School of Information Studies at UMD. Prior to coming to UMD, he was the head of resource description and metadata services and special formats cataloger at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. His professional and research interests include change management and organizational development in academic libraries. Joining him will be Bria L. Parker, metadata librarian at the University of Maryland Libraries, where she creates, transforms, and consults on metadata for a number of projects and collections. She received her Master's of Science in Information from the University of Michigan in 2009. Prior to coming to the University of Maryland, she was the Metadata and Digital Collections Librarian at NASA Goddard Library, where she helped launch the Goddard Library Repository. She previously served as the Audio Digitization Specialist at the University of Michigan Library, where she co-authored a paper on the challenges of audio for digital collections. Now, just a few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. Uh, one, today's library does not have interactive chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen. We won't be monitoring the Twitter feed, however. If you have questions for the presenters, please type them into the question box on your screen. The questions will be collated by myself and event coordinator, Santi Thompson. The speaker will answer them as time permits at the end of their presentations. Questions which remain unanswered while we are on the air will be answered offline and the responses sent to all attendees. And the second thing is that this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. Please take time to fill out that evaluation form since it will be used by the committee to plan future events. Okay, that's it for the technical stuff. And now I'd like to hand it over to Arwen for her presentation. Thanks, Liz. Can you hear me all right? I'm going to assume that is a yes. Okay. So as is probably clear from the title on, on my initial slide, I'm going to be talking to you today about the workflows we are developing here at UC San Diego for the ingest of digital materials. Uh, this is me. And this is where I am sitting in our Geisel library. So the first thing I want to do is talk to you a little bit uh, and give you an overview of our organizational environment and a smidge of history. I'll try to keep it relatively short, but I think it's very important for understanding the work that we're doing now and the processes that we're developing. Um, organizationally, there are four different programs or departments which are involved with the development and operation of our digital repository, which I'll usually just call the DAMS. Um, these programs are information technology, digital library development, research data curation, and metadata services. I'm part of the metadata services program and head of a group called the Digital Object and Metadata Management Unit. Unit. The unit consists of four metadata analysts, including myself, and our specialization is metadata for the dams. We provide metadata consultation to data providers, metadata wrangling, ingestive collections, and help with the development and management of the dams. Uh, so that you have uh, a picture of the system I'm talking about. This is a uh, front page of, our, of the public interface for our, our dams. 
we call it the digital collection site. This is a search results page from the, the system. Uh, for our collections, them, they um, include both cultural heritage materials and research data. Our cultural heritage collections include anthropological collections from Melanesia, uh, which is where this, this great image came from, local UCSD history, including materials from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography archive, a nice selection of, doc, the, of Dr. Seuss materials uh, that he's, um, who our library is named after, and Spanish Civil War collection, and many, many more. We also have a rapidly growing collection of research data from campus researchers, including some very complex and interesting objects. This lovely image, for example, is from a collection of astrophysics simulations. And this is the metadata record in, in the dams um, that this image came from. As you can tell, it's a very complex uh, record uh, with a, a, a rich kind of nested hierarchical structure. So to give a little bit of a technical uh, overview of our technical infrastructure, um, for many, many years our digital repository was a completely homegrown system uh, from both the data store and the, the UI. Uh, but as with all homegrown systems, there was a, a pretty high cost for ongoing system development and maintenance. Because of this, we started moving more towards technologies which are supported through community development model. Specifically, we've implemented a hydra head for our front end discovery layer. That's in this top right corner of that diagram, um, and we're actively involved with the Hydra community. Uh, the Hydra head itself draws on our dams repository, um, which is an RDF triple store, and which conforms to a locally developed data model for representing our objects. Uh, the data model itself is based on METS, MODS, PREMIS, some VRA, and, but also has a generous helping of local fields. We're also involved with work on the Portland Common Data Model uh, that's going on right now, and we're hoping that that might make it possible for us to adopt, adopt other community standards and community-developed tools, um, like Fedora, perhaps, or, or a, a community Hydra head rather than a, a locally developed Hydra head, without losing the richness and granularity that our current data model supports. So for personnel, we have a number of different roles that are involved in the dam's work. We have data providers, project managers, metadata analysts, and developers or programmers. Um, just to give you a brief idea of what these all, people all do, uh, the data provider uh, provides subject expertise. Uh, they select materials for collections, and they create the descriptive metadata for the, the items in the collections. The metadata analysts consult on how metadata can be created, descriptive workflows, we, uh, what we call wrangle, which is, you know, the normalization map, all that kind of metadata uh, management work. We wrangle the metadata after it's created and we shepherd it, the ingest of the collection into the dams. The developers work on the dams repository, our hydra head, and creating management tools, and also perform data transformations and ingests. And the project managers keep the whole thing coordinated, which is no small feat. Um, there's a, it's a very collaborative work environment. And uh, but one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is that for the purpose of for this presentation, particularly, is that in most cases it's the data providers who are doing the actual descriptive work. They're doing the cataloging. So we follow this model because they're the subject experts, and in some cases even the authors or creators themselves, and so they know the collections and materials best. This is especially uh, vital for materials which are not self-describing, so non-textual materials such as photographs or scientific data sets, and especially in the case of some of the research data, there's often a very high degree of specialization of knowledge that's, that's necessary to really understand what's relevant or important about a work. So given this organizational structure, our system evolution, our emphasis on, on the, the expert knowledge, we've historically approached the ingest of collections as individual custom projects. And this is what I've been calling our co custom input stream. What this looks like in practice is uh, something like this. So we start with the data provider, describing the collection and creating the source metadata. They then provide this to the metadata analyst. 
the metadata analyst then does the, the metadata wrangling, which includes metadata analysis, processing, cleanup, normalization of values, uh, mapping, and so lots of kind of uh, thinking and, and analysis here. We then create what we call an assembly plan. Uh, this is basically a set of instructions for transforming the source metadata into the target dam system conformant metadata, so, you know, what we want in the dams. The most important piece of this is a metadata crosswalk documenting the mapping of the source metadata to the target system metadata. Because um, of the need to be very explicit about uh, what, what are sometimes very complex mapping or processing instructions, a lot more complex than this, this put it in the notes field thing, um, but it's very, these documents can be very time intensive to create. So then once we've done that, we pass that off uh, with the source metadata to our IT developers. They then transform the source data according to the mapping, and then there's an iterative loop here of quality assurance and transformation adjustment. And once the transformation is finalized, let's see, the transformed records are then loaded into the dams and made available on our digital collections website. Uh, this process works really well for large batches of data which have very complex source metadata, but it's, it's pretty resource intensive and so isn't ideal for dealing with collections with uh, common um, source metadata formats. Um, because of this, we wanted to create a more efficient ingest method for these more commonly encountered metadata formats and simpler collections. So what I'm calling a standard input stream. And how we tried to do that is to try to automate the middle bit of that other diagram. So with the custom input stream, we're still starting with the data provider creating their source metadata, but unlike before, we have a much more limited range of acceptable metadata formats. They then give these, again, to the metadata analyst. We do some of the wrangling, but not as much of the, the mapping. We don't create the assembly plan. We don't have to do all of that complex documentation. Um, and when the metadata is all ready, we click a button, and voila, it's in the dams. Of course, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but you get the idea. So these changes have greatly simplified the process. Uh, the, the ingests, these, these ingests, these standard ingests don't require developer time. They greatly re it greatly reduces the metadata analyst time, and it eliminates a lot of the back and forth communication um, between the groups surrounding the ingest process. Um, so I want to, next I'm going to look and show what that little button does. Um, so this is one of the forms we use. We've got one for the mark and mods import, um, and we've got one for our Excel import, uh, but both of them look basically the same. Um, so like I said, the, the form itself doesn't look very complicated, but there's a lot going on under the hood. So to start with, we have a few tools for pre-ingest validation. They're in the box in the lower part, portion of the screen. The first option in this section is a metadata preview option. This creates an RDF XML uh, a version of the transformed source metadata. This allows the an analyst to review the metadata that will be generated during the ingest process and catch any obvious mapping errors. When relevant, it also validates source metadata against our controlled value lists for certain specific metadata fields. The next option is file match. Uh, this is simple but really kind of powerful little thing. It, it basically extracts the file names from your metadata and compares them to the files in your file ingest folder. It then uh, gives you a report uh, which, can, uh, which alerts you to if you have any file names in your metadata which do not have a matching file, so if you're missing any files, or if you have any files in your file ingest folder which are not linked to a metadata record. So it's kind of, it's a way to do a file inventory in an automated fashion. Uh, the third option is file validation, and this, what this does is it uses the EXIF tools error reporting to check the files on your file server to make sure there aren't any uh, validation problems, so, you know, corrupt PDFs, that sort of thing. So once we've done these pre-ingest checks and fixed any problems that come up, we, that we come up with, that come up during that process, we then can use this to ingest the collection. Uh, First, we have to assign some metadata within the form itself. 
This includes uh, the collection that the object belongs to, the source metadata format, the administrative areas, uh, for example, research data curation, digital library program, or special collections and archives, and also rights and access control metadata. So th we, ha we assigned these pieces of metadata within the form because the, the, those particular fields that we need, at least in the granularity we need, aren't consistently available in our source metadata format, so in the MARC and the MODS and the Excel. Um, we, of course, have to point it to the, the source metadata and the files, and then we click Submit. So after we click that button, what happens is the application transforms the source metadata into the DAMS data model conformant metadata. Uh, it assigns unique identifiers for each object. We use ARCs um, for our local objects, subjects, and concepts. Uh, the files are ingested, and technical metadata is extracted and encoded. Uh, derivatives are generated from those files. Checksums are run on the files and also stored in the metadata itself. And some basic provenance metadata is recorded for the ingest itself. So that includes the date of the ingest and the name of the person who uh, initiated it. The objects are then indexed in solar for discovery and viewing, and finally a report is generated logging whether we've, um, whether each task has been successful or if there's been a problem. The objects are then, they're in the dams and they're in a curator only review state where we can do quality assurance before publishing uh, the collection and making it publicly available. So like I said, there's a lot behind that little button. Um, from a metadata perspective, the biggest requirement is that the source metadata is standardized and conformant to uh, specifications. Otherwise, we won't get consistent transformations and consistent records. So far, we can take in three different formats, uh, MARC records, Archivist Toolkit, exported METS mods records, and Excel. I'm going to go through each of those in a little bit more detail. So we actually can pull our MARC records directly from our ILS using an uh, input bib number. Um, and pair them with one or two files that are that, that we also point to and ingest that, that into the dams as an object. This is largely being used currently for pulling in individual items digitized from our special collections and archives program, but we're also using it to bring in a few um, collections that are more of a batch ingest process. As you all probably know, MARC supports a, a wide variety of fields and subfields, and they can be used in different combinations depending on the type of material being described and the cataloging practices used. Because of this, we wanted to rely as much as possible on standard MARC to MODS transformation provided by the Library of Congress. Um, that got us close to where we needed to be, but since we're not using MODS as our internal data model, it wasn't enough, so that we then apply a locally developed MODS to DAMS for transformation which converts the MODS output to our system standard. We've also made some tweaks to both of these to accommodate local practices and decisions. We anticipate that we'll continue to tweak the transformations as we encounter new MARC tagging situations or combinations in the wild. The second format that we accept are METS records with MODS descriptive metadata exported from the Archivist Toolkit. One of the big advantages um, to using the Archivist Toolkit for digital objects and the METS export format is that they both support a really rich uh, encoding of uh, multi-part hierarchical objects or complex objects. So you can have items with child components, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, on down. Um, and each of these components can have, uh, have a lot of descriptive metadata attached. So for example, the astrophysics object I showed at the beginning of the presentation with the complex structure, that was done in the AT, described in the AT. And so using the AT input stream, um, not only does it support our archives who, who may be using the Archivist Toolkit just as part of their normal uh, workflow and process, but it also gives us a tool for creating these kind of really rich, complex objects. And finally um, is Excel. 
clearly Excel is not a standard metadata format in itself, it's just a file format, but we've developed a standard set of column headers and in some case data types to be used in, in a conformance spreadsheet. Uh, so when an Excel spreadsheet conforms to these targets, uh, columns and headers and guidelines, it can then be imported um, via our Excel standard input stream. We're anticipating that this format will get the most use, both for cultural heritage collections and also for data coming from researchers. The reason for this is that it's easy and familiar for, for non-expert users, and it's pretty powerful for data manipulation for more experienced users. Um, the other advantage is that because we're kind of setting the standard, so to speak, it can, it, it, it can actually represent and encode almost all of our local data elements. Uh, one of the big limitations, of course, is that the Excel and, and delimited file formats are inherently flat, and so they don't support representing structural complexity with the same naturalness that an XML format like METS does. But we have, um, we are able to uh, support description of parent, child, and grandchild, so three levels of hierarchy in, in our Excel format. Um, Okay, so we've got these new standard input streams uh, for conformant mark AT and Excel metadata. And this is what the workflow basically looks like. Um, again, the benefits of this work, more automated workflow is obviously improved efficiency. This gives the developers more time to develop rather than doing custom uh, ETL or, or ingest work, and it frees up more metadata analyst time for us to come up with new ideas and new tools for the developers to develop, so it's uh, more fun all around. Um, it also gives us a much faster and more predictable turnaround time for data providers. We think this will lead to improved data provider satisfaction and hopefully to increase development and deposit of new collections. The process also leaves less room for error by omitting the kind of telephone game that sometimes occurs between metadata analyst and developer when, when dealing with a custom uh, ingest, in and it uh, also makes our quality assurance process a lot easier. But the good thing is, for those collections which need it, we can still utilize the custom input streams. So as you can see, in that workflow, there's a lot more bi-directional arrow, arrows, a lot more possibilities for iterative loops, um, but it's still a really good process for collections with very complex, rich, or unique source metadata. So, speaking of workflows, one of the main ways we track these is uh, using a project tracking software called JIRA. This is a product that our IT department uses for development work, and uh, which is what the software is primarily designed for, but we found a lot of useful features for tracking other kinds of work within it. So, we've set up a section devoted to ingest work. In this section, we've added our local workflow flows for the custom and uh, standard input streams. And you can see these showing up as uh, the current status and the options for what the next step in the workflow will be. There are also a number of controlled, customizable, free text uh, fields to um, describe a project, who it's assigned to, priority, assigned tags, that sort of thing. Uh, as well as a comment section for conversations about the work, which didn't fit on this screenshot, but it's basically a list of unthreaded comments. We found this really useful because it puts most, more of the information about a project in a single shared space rather than splintered across different email accounts, different email threads, that sort of thing. And this is really useful for when someone needs to be brought into a project or for projects when, which need to be handed off to another metadata analyst or developer. It also makes it easy for the project managers to see how work is progressing, um, provide additional information, and weigh in on decisions. I think that this kind of public conversation thread is much more valuable when you have more people involved in, in, in the work. So if, if we had fewer people, this would probably be overkill, but since we have a lot of different people in different roles involved, it, it really helps to have that in a central place. The software also offers a lot of widgets and options, and I'm assuming a lot of the same functionality is available in other uh, project tracking software. Um, 
so I don't know. I, hopefully this isn't too soft, uh, Jira specific, but just wanted to give you kind of an overview of how we're using this kind of software and uh, what it offers. But what it also offers a lot of widgets and options for how you view the data. Um, so in this screenshot, for example, uh, we've got a pie chart of the ingest tickets by status, the number of active ingest tickets by uh, by the metadata analyst assigned to the, the ingest and the number of issues that are on hold for some reason. It also shows an ongoing feed of what's happening in the DI tickets in JIRA. So I'm still kind of grappling with how to really use this, these kinds of views and metrics to improve workload distribution and management and that sort of thing, but I think there's definitely a value here. We've also discussed the possibility of being able to generate uh, year-end type reporting from JIRA, but it sounds like it won't really be out of the box and it's, you know, still early days, so we haven't figured that out. Um, but for tracking some things, we still find ourselves gravitating towards a basic table. So there's definitely not one way to track these workflows, um, and, and we'll see how JIRA kind of ma matures as we really uh, put, put how, uh, a lot of these workflows are fairly new, um, at least in the formalized manner, and so really we, we need to uh, use them for a while and see how the, the tracking helps and what works and what doesn't. Uh, so developing these standard input streams really got us thinking about our uh, current established processes, other ways we can improve and increase efficiency, and as a result we've developed and are thinking about a, a lot of other tools to help. So some of these are to help with the metadata consultation work that we do, ways to improve communication with data providers, like easy to use custom easy, sorry, easy to customize mock-ups of what a data provider's object will look like in the dams. This is especially important with the research data uh, uh, data providers since they aren't as familiar with like the library paradigms of repository paradigms, that sort of thing. Um, user-friendly Excel documents that we can quickly customize um, and provide to a particular data provider for them to then do their description. Uh, checklists for what we need to know about a collection, um, and we're hoping all of these tools will make our consultations easier for us and easier for the data provider. We also have been working on some other things to support ingest, so again, revisiting our quality assurance process and seeing how we can streamline that and make it easier, um, less time consuming, creating kind of a library of, of cleanup tricks and tools either in Google or, I mean, sorry, uh, Excel or OpenRefine, so uh, um, macros and formulas and that sort of thing. Looking at possibilities for other uh, standard formats we might encounter uh, regularly, so other metadata formats that we might want to develop their own custom stand, sorry, that's redundant, uh, sorry, um, other metadata formats that we may want to develop a dedicated custom input form for. Um, enhancing ingest, the ingest provenance metadata that we store, and uh, looking at how we can archive the original source metadata. And finally, again, as I mentioned just a few slides ago, looking at how we can automate generation of metrics and reports. Uh, some of these we've just started to, we've just put in place and started to test out, and a few haven't been even built or implemented yet, but I think they're going to be good additions to our overall tool set. So we're also looking at ways to expand our services, and one of the big potential areas would be extending DAMS metadata work outside of our core unit and looking at ways to leverage the format and cataloging expertise in other metadata services services units to help with uh, description, for example. So while we think there's a lot of value in having data providers do the description, we think there's also great potential for using the in-house expertise of our catalogers to create original description for materials, uh, which, especially for materials which, like more traditional bibliographic materials, are at least somewhat self-describing. Um, there could also be a great deal of value in enhancement of metadata created by the data providers. So, for example, adding controlled headings, extraction of topics from um, the tech, the description that the data providers provide, linking to related resources, that sort of thing. Um, this could be especially useful for improving access to archival collections, which are digitized and made available under the kind of more product, less process approach, which 
utilizes more of the folder level metadata from a finding aid, um, but doesn't uh, look, isn't so much about item level cataloging. Um, we also have a lot of ideas and projects in the works related to our, our dams itself and managing uh, the data in there because it's got the underlying RDF triple store. We have lots of uh, interesting or exciting opportunities to kind of play with linked data, uh, look at authorities within the dams and I, uh, uh, um, how to manage those. So, um, and we also continue to work with our information technology uh, development team to develop management tools to help improve um, the dams itself. So lots of fun ideas and uh, as with in most places not nearly enough time to, to do them all. But And that is, that's all I have. So any questions? All right. Hey, thank you, Arwen. That was wonderful. Um, just a reminder to our audience uh, or attendees to please put your questions in the question box and we will uh, answer those as soon as those start coming in here. And just as a reminder to everybody, the recording of this presentation and the accompanying slides that Arwen just showed will be sent out after the session ends. Okay, you ready for the first question? Sure. Okay. So what types of metadata wrangling activities do you typically do for new collections? Um, let's see, okay, so if they're coming in through, so, so regardless of which way they're coming in through standard or custom, we do um, some analysis of what the actual values are and, and, and then um, kind of making sure that they're in the right fields. So even if, if that's an Excel thing in the right columns, um, possibly changing how they're mapped. So changing the note type um, or changing the, the, the subject type. We look for consistency in the values used. Um, so that can be, uh, we've used, uh, uh, we started looking at using OpenRefine for some of that, but but trying to use consistent terminology. So if they use um, an expanded acronym in one place, uh, trying to make sure that they're not then reverting to using the acronym in different places. So kind of consistency of terminology used. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Formatting of, of some of the data fields. So uh, we usually don't change date formatting, but we do add uh, um, basically W3C kind of encoded, you know, year, 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 month, month, day, day, formatted dates so that they're machine actionable. So even if the date is very, the original date that the data provider is very texty, like Easter 1975, then when possible we add some level of encoded dates. So at least that we have the year there in um, an easy to parse way. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more. We're working on, um, really kind of documenting and formalizing these because a lot of these have been so far it's very uh, up to the individual metadata analyst to take the data and really just kind of see what it needs. Um, we don't typically, again, and this comes back to our relying on the data providers for the description, we don't typically check to make sure that, you know, that that heading is indeed applies to that object. So we don't do that level of, of quality assurance on the metadata, but it is more looking at consistency and, and um, sometimes we will also give the data provider, uh, ask them for a little bit more on certain aspects if it seems like um, there's the ability to kind of enhance it in a, in a fairly easy way. Um, so we'll sometimes have a back, to, back and forth with them with improving the, the quality of the description. Excellent. Um, so Stephanie's asking, who are the users of the data in the dams? The users of the data, that's a really good question. We are hoping um, um, the world at large, but primarily the UCSD community. Um, we actually have just recently gone out of beta. I mean, we had a, we had the old dams was in non-beta and our new dams just went into out of beta. And one of the big things that we gained with that transition from dams three to dams four was that dams three, um, because of the way it was implemented, was not crawlable. 
uh, DAMPS 4 is. So we're seeing a, a large increase in traffic from um, Google, which is great, and we think that that will bring in more users in general. Um, but right now, it's kind of the the campus community is still our primary focus, both from a um, from the cultural heritage side and the research data side. But um, yeah, I, I think it's the general the, the the same audience that I think a lot of us are trying to reach. All right, um, Jeremy would like to know, could you discuss why you are using Wowza for streaming files as opposed to a more Hydra-based solution like Avalon? No. I don't know. <laughs> I, I could, I can, um, I will, um, if that goes into the questions to be followed up on, I will follow up with our IT folks. Um, it, it might be that Okay, I'm gonna. I said no, but now I'm gonna hazard a guess. Um, if I remember correctly, I think Aval is Avalon its own Hydra head, and we had already we've we've developed our own local Hydra head, and so um, there's some mismatch between that. Um, but that might not be the right answer. So I will definitely follow up with our IT folks and and ask. Okay. Um, so Bonnie asks, how do the data providers feel about creating metadata? Do they love sharing their knowledge or any pushback? And Vicki has a similar question about what type of consultation or training with the data providers. Right. Um, it can be difficult sometimes, and so that's one of the things that the, one of the reasons we have been really kind of focusing on um, looking at ways we can make it easier for them. There's two, kind of two different groups of data providers in this regard. Um, a lot of our internal library data providers, there's uh, there's a there's a very strong appreciation for. The, the power of the metadata, and so they're very they're much more engaged with that and and more interested in that, and that's kind of our, how our model developed was around those data providers that that did want to be actively involved in the description of their objects. Um, so then we you know and then we moved into this research data curation space where um, I think. The, the the researchers really do want to share their work and they want to share uh, talk about their work, but they are so busy that the, doing the actual description is is can, has to be um, pretty simple for them, and so that's why we're working on. But but sorry, and, but 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 it's more necessary that they at least provide some level of the description for us because of the specialization of the, the topics and the materials and the, the really very specific domain knowledge that is required in a lot of cases. Um, so that's why we're working on our cons consultation tool set and we're actually developing kind of, we're trying, I mean, like we just had an, our um, another meeting this 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 week, developing kind of a step by step how we go through these consultations with data providers um, to try to simplify this as much as possible, so that we give them the opportunity and uh, to to describe their resources and we get their expertise in describing the resources, but we do as much of the we facilitate that in as as much as we can. So rather than having topical headings and geographic headings and temporal headings, we have a keywords field that they add keywords to. Um, we can specialize that for certain uh, data providers so that um, if, if we know that there's something that they have expressed as being important, we can pull that out so that they can encode at a, a, at a more granular level, but then we can take that and enhance it and try to, to improve the, the encoding of the metadata. So um, it's, it's, int it's very interesting work and it's very, um, it's, it's really, it's interesting to try to strike that balance of really respecting the, the and, and, and capturing the, the unique, uniqueness of the material and the expert knowledge without overburdening some, some pretty busy people. But, um, so that's, that's kind of what we're working on. That's what some of the tools on the, I think the second to the last slide um, are kind of getting at. So on the flip side of that, how much training was involved with your staff? Janet, that was Janet's question. Um, uh, they've kind of gone through trial by 
uh, dumping in the deep end, so to speak, and learning to swim. I mean, part of the, the difficulty is two of our four staff uh, started in the last in the last year. And so I've been here for a relatively short period of time. And during that year, we were in a major transition phase technically and process-wise. So it's been really interesting. So they've been kind of um, learning to swim while they're you know, figuring out how we build all these tools, helping us figure out how to build these tools at the same time. And so it's it's been a very hands-on learning experience. Um, I think, and I think that that's been really useful, but I do think that, that developing these kind of consistent processes and uh, these consistent tool sets, which is what we're working, we're, as a group, we're really working on right now, and, and it's not just my group that's working on that, that's a collaborative process, both with IT and our project managers from DLD, the Digital Library Program and the Research Data Curation Program, so it's very collaborative, but I think having these much more formalized defined processes and tool sets will make subsequent training a lot easier. Um, so if we did have someone new who is going to be doing, actually, you know, we do have someone who's going to be start doing start doing some more project management work, and I think that even on that side, that that having these tool sets will really help. All right. Um, we have uh, similar questions from Robert and Annie about how you handle corrections to metadata for collections you already have in the system or uh, legacy collections. Yeah, okay, so that's one of the, the things that a lot right now, all corrections, and this is this is one of the things we're having, the, the RDF triple store has made things much more complicated than it is in a lot of systems, other systems, um, but a, any changes right now have to go through our IT developers. So that's one of the reasons we have a really rigorous quality assurance process is because we don't have easy tools for editing because of the relational nature of the, the RDF and the linkages. So for example, a subject in one of our, our records sort of, I'm doing air quotes around records, but the, one of the records that you see in the dam, so the subject is not actually um, that value, uh, so the, the name heading like uh, Theodore Geisel is not actually in that record, it's just a, an ARC, a, a URI that points to the record that has that value. And so because of that, that linked data structure for a lot of, of, of the, the metadata in our our dams, it makes editing a lot more complicated than uh, a typical kind of uh, record editing form. So uh, right now those go through ITD, so we largely do either, you know, urgent individual tweaks, but we also, they do a lot of, we do a lot of batch edit kind of, you know, corrections. So we describe it, they do it, we check it, you know. Um, we're, we're, they're actually in the process of developing a RDF uh, a, a functionality for my unit to be able to edit the RDF, so we'll be able to go in and edit individual pieces of data, um, and so that'll be that'll be really cool. We're very excited about that, um, but it does have limitations. It's not a GUI-based kind of edit thing. You're gonna ha we have to we have to be down in the the RDF XML, which is kind of a verbose. It's it's kind of. Uh, I don't know, it's kind of ugly. <laughs> well, thank you for answering those questions. We actually have more coming in, so there's a lot of interest in your subject. Um, but we're out of time for Arwen's subject or uh, section today. But we'd like to thank her for all the work she's put into this and to remind our attendees that we'll be emailing her answers uh, to all the questions that are still unanswered uh, out to everybody. And thank you, Arwen. We appreciate yes. it. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to turn our presentation over to Nathan and Bria. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. I um it, unmuting myself wasn't actually going the way that I wanted it to, so sorry about that. Uh, yes, so uh, I'm Nathan Putnam, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Bria. Hi, this is Bria Parker. I'm the Metadata Librarian. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, integrating new services into our existing workflows. Um, hold on one second. And uh, we're coming at a different, a very different place than 
uh, UC San Diego. Um, we have a very traditional cataloging department that we are trying to shift into doing more large-scale metadata repurposing and manipulation. Um, this is due in part to an increase in non-MARC metadata projects for our digital collections, uh, digital collections very similar to what Ar Arwen is working on. Um, we are trying to actually create new services within the libraries and we're consolidating practices that are found in multiple units, not only within the traditional technical services, but also over in our special collections uh, unit. And we are trying, I am really trying to expand the expertise within our own unit. Um, it just occurred to me. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, this is all relatively new to us, which I think you'll see from our uh, from our uh, presentation. Um, we are uh, working through several different staff changes. I've only been here for uh, about two years. Bria has been with us for one year. Um, and we've actually asked Bria to re-envision a lot of the metadata workflows that are within the department. And so we're trying to position ourselves to take more projects that require metadata cleanup and manipulation uh, as we continue to share, like I said, our digital collections. Um, hold on one second. Oh, come on. So uh, to kind of give you a setup as to what we have right now, uh, we are creating and manipulating high quality descriptive metadata for our digital objects and our uh, physical, um, for all of our research materials. This tends to be um, individual items cataloged one by one. Um, we do this through uh, five different units within our department um, comprising of faculty, graduate assistants, volunteers, uh, uh, things like that. We, um, our main functions are the traditional cataloging and what we're trying to get more and more into is the metadata processing, harvesting, uh, manipulation. Uh, we are, we also are involved a little bit in providing uh, input to our discovery tools and systems. We use WorldCat Local uh, and we're soon to be trans transitioning over into WorldCat Discovery uh, and so we have, you know, we're providing input in various pieces uh, like that. How we got to this place is that uh, is sort of the departmental evolution that's been going on. We've had a steady decline in physical materials. We have an increased uh, use of our WorldCat knowledge base to manage all of our electronic resources. This is eBooks, uh, various things like that. We also um, have an increase in our special collections cataloging. So this is kind of interesting because we still need to continue to have our normal cataloging procedures for our special collections materials, um, but uh, you know this is being kind of done separately from the decline of physical materials and things like that. Uh, we are also getting increased uh, requests for our descriptive metadata for our digital collections, and this may be pieces of um, ma uh, manipulating current existing metadata such as our mark records and uh, you know taking them off and putting them into um, our digital collections or uh, we may need to come up with brand new data for uh, descriptive data for these particular collections. So that's kind of the department evolution and so a year ago we went into that structure that I showed you on the previous slide and what was desperately missing from um, what we needed was uh, a set of new skills. What we did not have is anyone who had in-house expertise with dealing with non-MARC, non-RDA, non-AACR2 descriptive data. Um, and we were increasingly finding ourselves in positions where we needed someone to uh, use XSLT to transform an XML record from one thing to another uh, and, 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 you know, help clean up. There were units across the libraries that were dealing with this on their own um, but there was no systematic approach and what one person learned doing it that was not really shared with anyone else and so a lot of us were reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. Uh, we also have several new systems on our horizon. We're migrating um, to several of these. We are currently using a very outdated version of Fedora 2 point something and uh, like many people in the Fedora community we are working on upgrading to Fedora 4. 
Um, we are active users or trying to be active users with archive space. This is another community developed uh, tool for uh, our archival collections that we are in the, the, the development phases for and getting you know, our metadata from basically an access database is what it is right now and getting it into a much more standardized system uh, with this archive space. We are also working uh, with Hadi Trust. We have materials that we would like to send to them and we need to repurpose the metadata and do all the good things like that. So my kind of perspective as head of the department is how do I deal with these management issues uh, in terms of getting um, everyone on board. And one of the, I put this one first, although it's probably the most minor of uh, the issues, is um, assessment metrics for metadata work. You know, with a traditional cataloger, I can count the number of books, DVDs, whatever they are actually cataloging. But how do I deal with a metadata librarian who may be dealing with tens of thousands of records in a five minute uh, manipulation session or something like that. And so really considering how the metadata librarian or people who are doing non-MARC work, how do I track that from a management perspective uh, and go from there. Uh, my other two items really are the fact that, you know, we're a relatively small time operation. Uh, we only have a single dedicated metadata librarian now. She's only been here for about nine months. And we really need to increase our expertise if we want to be sustainable going forward. Um, we've done a little bit of this. We've managed to get some copy catalogers involved into non-MARC uh, non metadata sort of description within some of our depositories. Um, but you know we're looking to expand uh, our metadata, uh, our metadata operations. And in terms of metadata, I mean you know non-MARC, um, non-traditional uh, cataloging, which I think a lot of us are still facing. Um, we have a lot of legacy things going on. So overall, uh, things are looking up. We have multiple paths that we can definitely take in terms of the management issues and how we can deal with uh, uh, moving forward. Um, but choosing the right path is definitely going to depend on our current workflows, and we need to identify the adjustments that need to be need uh, that are needed to help us move forward and really get the staff and both faculty and um, uh, uh, the copy catalogers involved in making these changes. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is frame their work as traditional catalogers into the new model. So you're still providing description, you're still manipulating data, you're just not using MARC, you're not using AAC or 2, you're using something different that we can actually use uh, going forward web, uh, web wise. Um, so anyway, uh, what I'm gonna do now is hand it over to Bria and she's gonna talk about some of the issues that she has faced uh, since she arrived here about nine months ago. Bria? All right. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so as Nathan discussed, we really have only had workflows related to traditional cataloging. So how do we as a department take on more of a role in the growing needs for our digital projects? Well, they started by hiring a metadata librarian, me, and then I have kind of just tried to work on where we're going to go from there. And sorry, the announcement is not forwarding the slides, so that's a little disturbing. How's that? Sorry. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. One of the challenges that I face, particularly having to do with workflows involving metadata, is identifying the source of the metadata because this often impacts the workflows. <clears throat> so in traditional cataloging, as we all know, the metadata about the materials are created by our catalogers. But for digital projects, this is not always the case. So in some cases, materials have actually been described at the item level and they are actually in our ILS. But for archival materials, I'm looking for some kind of item level inventory, it won't even exist. A creator, I am more often a funnel point. I'm a manipulator, a crosswalker, a transformer, a normalizer, a wrangler, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So generally speaking, for these digital projects, I'm not acting as creator, as I said, um, which is which is 
which is really a departure from our department's traditional workflows. Um, my work is more in the batch, batch processing of digital objects instead of single object creation. So the main workflow issue I face actually breaks down into multiple issues. There's locating the source metadata, which I just briefly outlined, and getting it into the appropriate template. <clears throat> Excuse me. This workflow surrounding The metadata records are in our ILS. I can extract them, extract them via Z3950 um, or put in a request for, from our catalog database management department to retrieve them. So in those situations, the workflow will generally start with me or potentially someone else within our department. For archival materials, I'm usually looking for some type of item level inventory. And these can be a mixed bag because each inventory is going to collect different metadata or it'll collect it just a bit differently or as is often the case the metadata collected is insufficient for our metadata templates which I'll talk about later. In these situations collection managers for even my department to arrange for a description. Um, for example, we have a book digitization project that's in its early stages, and these books hadn't been cataloged, so Nathan handled assigning the cataloging work to one of our catalogers, who then notified me, and then I was able to extract the data from the ILS and perform any necessary transformation and wrangling prior to it being ingested. So one thing I noticed when I, when I started working here was that there was not a lot of consistency to how metadata creation for digital projects was being approached. So metadata creation was sometimes being done by digitization techs um, in a different department. And that's not bad in and of itself, but I felt that for the digitization text with, with some very um, explicit guidelines on how to collect the metadata, such as um, title structures for photos and sound recordings that have no explicit titles. So an example of this is I'm currently working with one of our collection curators to and his assistant to determine appropriate metadata um, for an audio collection that has no inventory whatsoever. It's just boxes and boxes of reels that have kind of inconsistent handwritten notes about what's contained on them. So I've worked with them on what fields they would need um, to fit in our templates, how they might go about making their own lives easier. Um, and to that end, it was uh, Bria, can you hear me? Pathetic. Oh no. There, there she is. Bri, are you back? I am here. Could we um, have you pause for a second and we'll have you uh, log out and dial in by f telephone? Okay, I am super sorry. <laughs> We apologize for the technical issues, everyone. Uh, we'll give Bria just a second to log back in here. Yeah, and Bria and I are actually on two different floors within the building, so I think that's uh, to be in separate offices.
I guess while we're waiting for her to come on, one of the things that, you know, her point for the slide here is that we are dealing with, and many of you are dealing with the fact that you are getting data from all over the place, and the people who are working yeah, with the data are coming from all over the place. Bria, is that you? Yes, it is. Can everybody okay. hear me? I am so, so sorry and mortified right now. <laughs> we no, you're coming in really clear. Yeah. Well, okay. Turn over to you guys. Okay, so um, I have no idea when the audio went out. So if someone, if if Nathan could maybe tell me when he stopped hearing me. Hello, am I gone again? Can you hear me? I can't hear anybody. If anybody is talking. I can hear you loud and clear, Bria. Okay. Nathan, are you still out there? I'm still out here. Can you give me a hint as to where my sound went out? Uh, yeah, so the slide that's up right now, I was basically saying you're getting data from everywhere and that anyone could be dealing with the data. So we're getting inconsistency with the creation and the workflows who's doing it. So I think you're good to go on the next slide. Um, okay. If, if, any, if people have questions, we can address it at the end. Um, so once I know the metadata source, I can then map it to um, whichever spreadsheet goes with the project. So that could be the Google spreadsheet template used for in-house digitization and upload to the Internet Archive. It could be the spreadsheet that we use for sending items to the Internet Archive for them to digitize and upload. Or it could be our own in-house template that we use for um, vendor digitized um, collections or our locally digitized collections going into our own system. And we did at one point have separate templates for each format, but I've at least gotten that down to two, a text one and an AV one. Um, so those existed. Um, some of the projects that existed before I came on board are even using an additional spreadsheet. So it can take a minute. It's taken a while to get oriented to all the different workflows um, around here, and it's um, not uncommon for new workflows to even pop up um, recently that I was not aware of. So then when we, when we add to all of those templates, the additional templates to create for vendor digitized projects that they don't require much metadata, but they still need to be done and we need to figure out by whom um, and when because it's part of the the shipping, the vendor shipping workflow. Uh, so I work a lot with a manager of our digital conversion and <clears throat> Okay, sorry, I'm going to try and talk louder. I work a lot with the manager of our digital conversion and media reformatting department on figuring out who fills these out and when. Um, and then additionally, there are projects that don't fit into any of the previously mentioned templates. And these are either collaborations with other institutions or, or just something completely different. Um, and then I've got to figure out what to do with those. And so with so many so many different templates, it's not uncommon for me to start running into problems and inconsistencies. So one challenge I've had since, since I started is obviously getting all these different practices and workflows and spreadsheets straightened out. And the various departments around the library were so used to there not being a metadata librarian and they were used to doing everything themselves. And they were more than happy to hand some of the work they used to do over to me when I started, but it was not without, without its wrinkles. Um, so, you know, I would receive an email requesting that I please fill out such and such template for this collection, and they'd provide me the inventory. I'd map the inventory over to the template, send it back to them, and they'd, oh, yeah, we meant the other such and such template. Oh, okay. So um, identifying these workflows, in all of the workflows has been a struggle. Um, there was a bit of a learning curve. So, and I'm, I'm glad Arwen talked about JIRA because we also at UMD use JIRA for our project management um, in digitization projects. So, as she said, it's a project management tool that can help us track projects and issues related to specific projects. And these issues can be assigned to different people as tasks are completed and the workflows are run through. In the past, it has been used to indicate to our systems librarian um, and our digital systems and stewardship department that material is ready to be ingested into our local collection. And we have implemented a new step 
since the spreadsheets change hands so much during the entire process from when the inventory is created to the mapping sent for digitization, get it back, have QC, um, it's just been changed, changes hands so much that um, we've implemented uh, a new step because how much Excel can mess up things like dates and anything with a number. Um, so we have had issues because the metadata template, um, I updated it when I started here um, to, to work a little bit better with our ingest system that our systems librarian created. So, sorry. <laughs> We had enough problems because projects started with the old template. We had enough problems with that old template trying to get ingested into our system, and that obviously wasn't going to work. We needed a new template. We just kept running into so many problems in the systems library, and we keep having to come back to me. We implemented a new step where I now, when the when the ticket is created in Jira, that a collection is ready to be ingested, instead of notifying whoever is going to do the ingest, I am now assigned the issue so I can perform a final review and validate it. Um, the systems librarian actually developed a little um, a Python script to, that I can use to validate the spreadsheets to make sure they have all the required fields and that they're populated. Um, so this has been a big shift for metadata services. We're, you know, now someone from metadata services is involved at the end of the pro process. Um, and I'm willing to be involved at any stage, and in most cases I'm M, but being able to set up policies and workflows in collaboration with other units, digital conversion, digital projects, about the templates, who's responsible, um, that's, that's been extremely helpful. So I am involved at other stages, um, but this, this new part, this final review, has been very helpful in, in catching a lot of errors. So here's a little generic example of one of our workflows as it now stands. And this final review portion at that bottom, highlighted in yellow, is really the only new step. But as I said, it's been, it's been very important. And it's a departure in workflows. And that my work was usually done at that extract crosswalk to local template. Um, so in, here's a sample in, in cases if the metadata is coming from the ILS. I'm probably responsible for most of the metadata um, work. Um, and then this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's a sample workflow of what might happen if it's from an archival inventory. So again, there's that final step highlighted in yellow, but for this process, it's possible that a curator or a um, collection manager would be working with the metadata most of the time. But being involved near the end of the project is definitely new for us. So that new step in JIRA has helped solve one of the workflow issues surrounding all of those multiple metadata templates, which was um, quality control, quality assurance issues. However, that was just for projects going into our local digital collections. There are still other workflows that um, we're currently addressing as we move on um, to some, some new projects. So, and as I approach the one year anniversary of my hire, um, I'm beginning to see more projects come full circle. You know, ones that started when I started, I'm, I've gotten to see the whole process. Um, so now I have some additional insight on how we can address some other workflow issues. So I'm hoping I can increase our department's use of project management tools. Um, I loved a lot of Arwen's descriptions and what she showed of their use of JIRA. So that's going to be extremely useful for me to go back and, and look at how we can incorporate more of our workflows in JIRA. And since I'm actually around as we begin this next round of project planning for the upcoming fiscal year, I've gotten to be a lot more involved in the planning, and each project has a charter that um, documents all aspects of the project, but particularly important to me are the metadata creation and collection aspects. And so being able to give input and clarify expectations for this aspect has been great, and it's another kind of new service that <laughs> our department can provide to our digital projects um, unit. And also, the manager of our digital conversion unit has initiated an update of her unit's best practices, and her inclusion of metadata issues has been a good opportunity to review practices and workflows and bring all of our practices into kind of a, a, a lot more consistency across the library. 
There are also some ongoing shifts that Nathan talked about a little bit in the workflows that have stemmed from the adoption of the WorldCat knowledge base. So we use the knowledge base to, currently we use it to manage our ebook holdings rather than as records bulk loaded into the ILS. And this isn't, it's not really a new workflow from the ground up per se, but it's a bit of a uh, change for our department because rather than having batch loaded MARC records that we load into the ILS from vendors, we're now batch loading the data via spreadsheets, yes, more spreadsheets, um, into the knowledge base. Um, but then there's the question of who's responsible for this workflow. Um, and it's not just the catalogers. Currently, um, I'm working on some of it. We have a few other trained catalogers as well as some staff, and we're still working out how to train more in the department to handle this work. Um, I'm gonna have to skip a little bit because of the technical difficulties, but I'm gonna try and touch on some hopefully useful things. Um, one of the solutions I have talked about thus far is improving workflows, but the size and the scope of the projects, as you can hopefully see, has been difficult for just one person to keep up. So I've been able to train um, some people to participate and aid with these workflows. And just this past spring, I was able to train a staff member interested in helping um, on our local AV metadata template. So I was able to train him on that, and he was able to clear a backlog of audio metadata that reached back nearly three years. Still not sure why there was such a backlog to begin with, but I, I was just extremely excited to have his help with it and to get it done. Um, another challenge is sometimes you just want to be invited to play. One of the underlying challenges in incorporating all these new services is getting the word out that you provide those services. Um, too often, the thought of including our department occurs late in the process, in the pro um, project planning process, or even worse, not at all. So I've had to work a lot to insert myself into the conversation, um, and now that I'm here, like I said, for the beginning of some of these projects, um, it, it's working a lot, a lot better. It's meant more meetings, but it's been worth it to begin to notice patterns in how work is getting done. Um, so yes, just, just getting involved. Um, I'm not always gonna be the person doing the mapping or the creation of the metadata anymore. Um, that's not necessarily a problem, um, but it's great to just be able to confirm that what they're doing is consistent. Um, another approach that I am working on, it's still fairly new, is I spend a half a day each week in our special collections, which is where I have the most collaboration regarding digital collection metadata and making myself available there has been very helpful because people can ans you know, ask questions to my face as they see me, they, oh yeah, I wanted to ask you about this, this project. So it's been very important to open lines of communication. Um, I don't really have a silver bullet from that other than being um, annoyingly persistent. Um, so oops. we have some large projects. We're working on a Fedora 4 implementation, which is gonna be a major shift as we move from a local metadata schema in XML to linked data. As Nathan mentioned, we have our archive space implementation and we are not necessarily doing um, the actual data cleanup. We're providing support for them um, and guidance for their data mappings. Uh, additionally, talked about how do you trust and um, we're gonna continue work with Internet Archive and some other linked data projects. And I'm gonna turn that back over to Nathan to wrap up. So uh, some of our future goals that we are looking for, we would like to continue to work more and more with the selectors on metadata creation. So if they have a project that they would like to digitize, maybe we can help have them help us create uh, the descriptive metadata. Um, we also plan to continue and to train and support staff on NART, uh, on the um, uh, non-MARC metadata. Uh, we've done a little bit of this more. It's really done at the copy cataloger level, and what I'd like to see is more of the, the professional librarian, uh, the, we have faculty librarian, um, really start to take a role in creating non-MARC metadata. Uh, last but not least, I really need to hire a new metadata librarian. Really. Non metadata. And it's really now just a matter of putting all of our workflows together, our future goals, uh, and 
uh, promoting our new services to not only to ourselves within the libraries, but uh, to our colleagues across the university. So uh, we're, we're really sorry about the technical glitches, but if we would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you to both Bria and Nathan. We appreciate that, uh, especially in light of all the technical issues. Um, and people have been already putting in their questions in the questions box. So we appreciate that. Anyone else with questions, please go ahead and put those in. And um, we'll start with our first question then. Uh, John asked if um, you could give examples on enhancing and expanding metadata expertise for cataloging for copy cataloging staff. But what we really needed was a quality check on the metadata, and so I worked with the copy catalogers to. Um, I worked with the copy catalogers to do copy cataloging process on the postcards. Uh, you know, they're not in MARC, they're not in the system um, uh, using AAC or two or things like that. And so that was really my goal. And apparently I keep cutting out. So I don't. Bria, if you can hear me, can you talk about copy cataloging postcards? Oh, no, now I'm clear now. I, I'm on a wired connection too, so I, I, I'm not entirely sure what's going on with our connections here. Um, Nathan, as far as the postcards, that project was before my time. So oh, it I was. I don't have a whole lot of insight on it. <laughs> so before I cut out again, it was copy cataloging procedures for in our digital repository. So they'd call the image up, they would see the descriptive, they would descriptive data, they would make sure that it matched. And it's really stressing you are doing copy cataloging, but not using marker AAC or two. Okay, um, let's see here. Melissa asked if Nathan could talk about how they envisioned, how much they envisioned about the metadata piece before hiring Bria. Uh, we had a metadata librarian, although he was kind of part meta metadata, part traditional AV cataloger. And so the conversations in the higher ups within the organization were we need a dedicated full-time metadata librarian that had MARC expertise, but that would not be their focus. And so, you know, we've been talking about it for a while, and uh, we would have hired someone much sooner, but we've had budget issues um, and, you know, higher priorities in terms of um, hiring other people. So, you know, the, the we've been definitely discussing it for a while, and I'm starting to lay the groundwork to hire more. Um, Non non traditional catalogers, but it, it'll take some time. All right, and Rita asked, uh, in what cases do you take metadata from the ILS, and would you be willing to share your templates? Um, the cases where we're taking metadata from the ILS is basically if it's going if, if it's cataloged. So recent projects. Um, have been books. Um, there has been a digitization of some of one of uh, the um, a film collection that we have is also digitized. So it's it's a case by case basis. It's it's basically determined by if it is already in the ILS, we'll use that metadata to start with. Um, and we could we could share our templates. I think I have a um, a GitHub account that we could. Could throw them up on there. They're they're quite specialized to our our system because we have some like repository browse terms we use and 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 the like. But I'd be willing to put those up on our our GitHub account or my GitHub account, I guess. Well, thank you guys for being willing to share. Um, Linda also asked about your template. She wondered um, if you could explain how you reduce the number of metadata templates for all your projects and what are the advantages? Isn't each project collection very different from the previous? So the advantages is com becomes more in the automation side. Um, what happens with the template once it's sent to ingest and how I work to reduce the number of metadata templates is really um, due to the heroic work of our systems librarian who is the one who is responsible for the scripts that take the metadata, match it with a file, and ingest it into our system. And so he was able to make that a little bit more flexible 
because it had been very rigid with the data it's expecting. And so he was able to make that a little bit more flexible from a, for us. Um, and I mean, that's, that's the advantage. Yes, each project is going to be a little bit different, but generally, at least for our archival collections, there's a lot of the same types of metadata, the title, description, dates, um, some subject terms, if they're available, or repository browse terms. So the advantage is just, um, it's an advantage in that it gives fewer templates for the people that are filling them out to have to maintain expertise on, um, but it also is an issue once it leaves my hands, leaves our department's hands, um, it's very useful to our systems people to not have to have a different ingest script for every single template. All right. Um, Bethany asked a question for Nathan. He, she wanted to know, uh, you mentioned looking to add new library services in your department. Can you talk about those plans? Uh, yeah, the, the services that we're really looking to add focus much more at the university level than specifically within the libraries. And so, you know, we do a lot with metadata creation for our digital collections, but we would like to serve a metadata role to the broader university community. And some of the things that we've talked about is helping with data management plans for faculty who need one because they're writing for a grant. So grants these days need some sort of data management plan and we want to be able to help them out. Um, we've been working, Metadata Services has been working closely with our systems division. Oh, I think we lost you again, Nathan. Oh well. <laughs> You'll answer that one via email then? I, I will, yeah. Okay. So sorry, guys. Um, will has a question. Uh, could you share your workflow for special collections items? Are you repurposing descriptive mark data for a digital surrogate? Um, our, our workflow for special collections, it's still, it's still evolving as I try and get myself more involved in the process. Um, it's mostly they'll have the inventory and they're now trained as well as some of their GAs are trained to use the, the appropriate template. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the repurposing descriptive mark for digital surrogate. Um, I'm not sure we're doing that. I, I know that when we have it, when something is digitized, I have a GA who is creating, um, he's deriving records for the digital object if it's something that is in our catalog. Was that, is that an answer? I don't know, Nathan might know more about that. I, I thought that was good. And uh, Will, if that didn't answer your question, please feel free to submit another one and we'll, uh, if we have time, we'll address it or, uh, oh, he says yes. He said yes. yes yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Uh, and Janet asked, how do you prioritize your projects? Um, as far as the prioritization of digitization projects, which is mostly what I'm working on, that comes from that comes from outside of the department, um, outside of the metadata department. That is usually coming from our digital conversion and um, media reformatting unit, and that is based on something else entirely. Um, There's a I, committee I, involved, and yeah. Yep, yep. Um, also, it depends on funding and when it's available. Um, as far as how I prioritize my work on the projects, a lot of that will have to do with deadlines that the manager of the digital reformatting unit sets up on when she wants to ship something. Um, so that's, it, it trickles down from, from the priorities of digital um, collection, of the digital projects down to me, and that's how I prioritize my work. All right. And we have uh, two questions, quick questions, and I think we'll be wrap up for this session. Uh, Janet is asking how long you've been using JIRA and Jeanette would like to know it, what other project management tools in addition to JIRA you are using. Um, I don't know how, I mean I've been using JIRA as long as I've started here. Um, I don't know when the university or when the library began its use of it so I'm sorry I can't be more helpful with that. Um, Right now, I'm sort of experimenting with using Trello for my own personal project management. Um, 
I haven't investigated that a whole lot, uh, um, but that has helped kind of keep some some project tracking um, at the foreground for me and kept things from slipping away. But I'm still more in investigation investigation stages. All right. Well, we want to give a special thank you to our presenters today, especially with how intrepid they were with all of our technical issues. We appreciate um, all of our attendees for their questions, too. And if there's any that haven't been answered or you have some last-minute ones, go ahead and throw them up, and we'll email them to our presenters and have them answer them for you. All right. Um, Oops. Pardon one second here. Apologize. Um, okay, we would like to uh, give a special thank you for our presenters, Arwen, Nathan, and Bria, for sharing these exciting new potential workflows for metadata creation and maintenance. And we would also like to thank our attendees. We hope you found today's presentation useful. Um, you will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help the LX Program Committee plan new virtual pre-conferences and webinars for the future. Um, before we end, I'd like to thank our wonderful 10 co-sponsors that you can see listed here. Um, we appreciate their help getting the word out about this pre-conference. Uh, we'd also like to remind everyone that there is still time to sign up for our very last session. It's tomorrow at the same time, and we'll be discuss discussing techniques and technologies for developing local controlled vocabularies. And we'd like to remind everybody that there's also five in-person Alex pre-conferences being offered at the ALA Annual Conference in San Francisco this year, if you're planning to attend. Uh, the details and registration for these Alex pre-conferences can be found at the Alex annual webpage, which you see listed at the bottom of this slide here. And last but not least, we'd like to thank Joseph Nicholson for the continuing or from the Continuing Education Committee for providing the technical support for today's webinar. The support he and his colleagues on the technical support subcommittee provide make it possible for us to pre present these webinars smoothly. And we'd also like to thank Emily Whitmore from the Alex office and members of the Alex program committee for their help today. Uh, all right, thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and we hope you'll uh, participate in our other Alex webinars and continuing education offerings again in the future. <laughs>